Welcome back to Liberty Bites on the Think Liberty Network. I'm your host, William Gadsden. You can follow me personally on Facebook at William Gadsden Political Commentator and follow Think Liberty on Facebook, Twitter, or whatever your favorite social media outlet is. We also have a Patreon now, so if you'd like to support our work, check it out at patreon.com slash thinklibertypatrons. All right, so I'm going to start this episode out with a bit of a shameless plug. Uh, But this last week, um, I had an article published on beinglibertarian.com titled Civil Disobedience and the Next Battle for Virginia. So in case you haven't read it, I basically expound a little bit on the idea of what the next steps are for Virginia. So as most of you already know, almost immediately after the protests on January 20th, they still, excuse me, the Virginia legislature still passed seven out of the eight primary anti-gun laws that were being proposed. So a lot of people on both sides of the argument as far as the protest did a lot of good, it was a show of force, or the protest did nothing at all. Both sides are claiming a victory or, or claiming that their point of view is supported by um, the gun laws still passing or at least that they were able to go out there and do something about it. So what is the next step after that if we assume that as a result of these laws still passing, what is to be done? We tried protests, we tried petitioning, we tried all of these different things. So what is next? So in the article I talked about how a lot of the founding fathers faced the same question. So some of them wanted to go to war with the British crown immediately. Some others wanted to explore other peaceful options, and some of them were also in the middle. So what I talked about in there is that there there is going to be an escalation, right? It's going to happen one way or another. So the question is, what form does that take, and how is it executed? So in this particular episode, I want to expound a little bit on some of those ideas that I wrote about, and especially because... What we are seeing right now is happening on the state and the local levels. And the federal government has essentially just completely stepped out of the equation. The president, uh, Congress, no one on the federal level is doing anything either to stop this or to further it. So it's really up to us. It's up to the citizens on the ground here. And there's a few different ways that this could go before it comes down to violence and bloodshed. And all of these action should be explored, if at all possible. And this is just my opinion. But I want to break this down into a three-prong process, right? So you've got nullification, protests, and civil disobedience. These are the three options that I foresee coming up in the very near future as everything sort of comes to a head legislatively, especially in Virginia, but in a lot of other states around the country right now. So as far as nullification is concerned... There's this idea of 2A sanctuaries, right? So the idea is that on the county level or otherwise the local level that the city council or county council can come together and vote for a, a proposal or a referendum naming their locality a Second Amendment sanctuary county or a sanctuary city. So in order to give, we have to be honest about this, let's give the left their due. They started this idea of nullifying federal or state laws on the local level. Of course, I'm talking about sanctuary cities in regard to immigration. So let's give that credit where credit is due. They started this idea, but now it's morphing into, instead of being about immigration, a lot of folks are adapting this idea to Second Amendment sanctuaries instead, saying that they will not recognize anti-gun laws or gun control laws that are being proposed at a higher level from the local uh, local government. So you've got these counties and localities, especially in rural areas, they're refusing to be governed by the government elites at the next step higher or even the level after that. We see the same principle being carried out with marijuana laws. So there's definitely a pattern here across several different big issues in our country that the answer seems to be nullification. And it's working pretty well so far, at least with firearms and illegal, excuse me, at least with marijuana and illegal immigration. So 
Another thing that I want to point out here are the two sides involved. So you have the state government, at least in the case of Virginia and several other states, that are trying to pass these clearly unconstitutional, clearly politically biased laws, and they're being voted in strictly along party lines in almost every case. So another thing we're seeing here is a clear divide between rural citizens and those in the cities. So, of course, the population centers, we see this happening in Colorado, Virginia, California, and this is also what prompted the year-long riots in France, is you have two different groups of people from two very different backgrounds and, and ways of life that don't understand one another, and they're not necessarily interested in understanding one another either. Generally speaking, one side, those that live in rural areas, they just want to be left alone. They just want to live their lives. But you have the population centers that have political control over the entire region, and they are the ones that don't understand these rural individuals or their way of life, and they don't care. So they're shoving these laws down their throats, whether the rural population wants it or not, and they don't care. So you've got this idea of nullification while staying in the same state. But there's also a lot of talk going on right now as far as West Virginia essentially absorbing several Virginia counties that aren't going to follow these laws. So that would be... It's related to nullification, but at the same time, it's a bit different. You're not, strictly speaking, ignoring laws. You're certainly doing something that's relatively unprecedented historically and joining an entirely different state based on the laws that are being passed in the state you're currently in. So all of these different things are going on at the same time. Now, as far as nullification is concerned, on a more extreme level, you're also seeing in states like Oklahoma, and I think uh, some, pr some proposals have been made in a few other states, to essentially disallow federal law enforcement or any other federal agents from operating inside of that state without expressly being escorted by, for example, the local sheriff or something along those lines. So this is, again, a, an action that would decentralize power from the federal level back down to the state level. Or, of course, in the other cases between the counties and the state, decentralizing power from the state level down to the local level. And all of these things are, are good approaches, I think. They're all peaceful, they're controlled, and people are getting, they're making their voices heard. So the second thing that I wanted to discuss here is the idea of protests. So we saw, obviously, the giant, giant protests with tens of thousands of people in the streets of Richmond on the 20th. Uh, more recently, there were a group of uh, armed protesters that actually walked into the Kentucky State House, which, I mean, the balls on these guys. I, I can't express my respect and admiration for these folks enough. It was entirely peaceful. They walked in, they took some pictures, they left, and that was it. Of course, the media is taking the ball and running with it and saying that, you know, these are these are terrorists and, and terrified visitors to the state capitol, you know, were fleeing in their wake and all of this other all these other different things. It was a protest, period. And they made their voices heard and they're being seen for what it is. And while all of these are helpful, again, you still have to take into account that some governments aren't going to take it into account. They're not going to look upon this as something that they really need to consider when they're passing these kinds of laws. Exhibit A being the Virginia legislature still passing seven out of eight of the uh, the gun control wish list, if you will, just days after one of the biggest armed protests in American history. Which brings me to the last point here, which is civil disobedience. So for legal reasons, going forward in this particular topic, I want to clearly state I am in no way encouraging or calling on anyone to brazenly break the law. I'm just expressing what I think will happen and what my opinions are on it. So that being said, I talked in my article a lot about how we're going to have to start becoming communities again to counter these new and grossly unconstitutional unconstitutional laws that are being passed. So what does that mean to become a community again? 
it means getting to know your neighbors. It means getting to know them on a personal level, whether you have, you know, a block party or a neighborhood barbecue or just saying hi and chatting with them when you're coming home from work or what have you. It means becoming better neighbors on a personal level, but also discussing politics with them. See what see where they stand on these different issues. And if they're not politically involved or they don't know a lot about it, which is a lot of people, then the onus is on you to help educate them and help bring them into the conversation on these extremely important ideas. Because when it comes down to it, politics will affect them whether they're involved in it or not. So we have to get to know our neighbors better. Take your friends to the local gun range, right? Maybe somebody isn't a gun guy or a gun gal, and that's not something they're interested in, but invite them out. Tell them it's a good time. Show, Walk them through all the different uh, safety procedures and, and proper responsible uh, gun, uh, gun control is not the right word here. Edit this chunk out. Take your friends to the local gun range, even if they're not a gun guy or a gun gal. Maybe it's something they're not necessarily interested in, but encourage them to go with you anyway. Show them all the different safety procedures. Show them how to responsibly own and use a firearm and educate them along the way. Get them involved. So another part of civil disobedience, and this is where it gets a little bit stickier, is that militias are also forming all around the Southeast in response to this new wave of gun legislation proposals that are coming up in all of these different states. So you've got these militias that are forming, and this last weekend there were two counties in Virginia that actually had militia musters. So the already formed militias had a call-up to muster. Um, it's a show of force, yes, but it's also these groups coming together and practicing you know, organization coming together and doing drills and training and this sort of thing. So this is already actively happening right now. You're also going to see a total disregard for certain laws, right? Whether they, whether the disregard be, is open or covert. So what I mean by that is you're going to see people staging armed protests, for example, like we already saw, even after certain open carry laws or certain ownership laws have been passed. So they will be openly disregarding these laws in order to make their voices heard. To And this would be a form of civil disobedience. But you're also going to see a lot of agorism going on, I guess for lack of a better word. You're going to see people stockpiling weapons that they think are going to be made illegal very soon. They're going to be stockpiling ammo. They're going to be you know prepping, if you will. So you have a little bit more covert civil disobedience going on. More importantly, and going back to what I was talking about, about sort of reforming, redeveloping these communities, is that you're going to start seeing people look out for one another more. So what I mean by that is it's not going to be neighborhood watches that are out looking for shady characters or people that, you know, don't don't belong in the neighborhood or I don't recognize this person. Instead, it's going to be neighborhood watches looking out for the local police department's armored vehicles and SWAT teams, you know, rolling down the street for a, a gun confiscation. And they're going to be alerting their neighbors that, hey, this is what's going on. They're going to start calling one another to take matters into their own hands in their own neighborhoods and in their own communities because they don't trust the government entities that exist for these services anymore. They don't want them involved. So these people are going to go out of their way to show their government that they don't need them and they don't want them. You're also going to start seeing folks clamming up and refusing to talk to law enforcement in the first place, again, because there's a certain level of inherent distrust coming in with these new waves of gun control laws and also infringing on other civil liberties. So if you can't trust law enforcement, then why would you work with them in the first place? So they're going to be refusing to cooperate with law enforcement and even many other agents of the state, not just law enforcement, but maybe city planners and, and the EPA and groups like this. So while all of this is going on, communities are also going to become more tight-knit, but that means that they're going to become more distrustful of outsiders. Take that for what you will. I think it's all a double-edged sword no matter how we look at it. And of course, 
folks with drill pre- drill presses and Tom Petty albums are going to be getting a lot busier. Again, take that for what you will. And as things continue to escalate around our dearest freedoms and liberties in this country, we very well may see bloodshed happen eventually. And I pray that doesn't happen. I pray that our governments will, uh, government officials will come to their senses and stop pursuing this reckless uh, agenda to infringe upon our civil liberties. I hope that it doesn't come to that. But at the end of the day, only time will tell what happens in the future. But it is coming to a head one way or another. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about this episode. I appreciate you watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope you come back and listen to us next week to become more liberty-centered with us. I'm William Gaston with Liberty. Yeah.